Good morning. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about some open source security tools that you can use for Kubernetes uh, and the applications running on top of Kubernetes as well. Uh, as uh, the gentleman said, I'm Michael Ducey. I work for a company called Sysdig. Uh, we have several open source projects that are focused on not only security, uh, but also performance and troubleshooting. And my role is pretty much, well, a lot of things with those open source projects. Uh, ask me what my job is and I'll tell you. So for the agenda, uh, we're going to talk about kind of the layers of container security and how uh, a lot of people in the Kubernetes world is starting to kind of categorize things. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the challenges of container security and kind of interspersed as we go through each layer, I'm going to talk about open source tools for each layer. Uh, the two things that I'm going to concentrate on the most uh, and spend the most time on is the build layer uh, and then also the runtime layer as well. So. When you think of the layers, you can kind of think of them uh, like this. So we have the underlying infrastructure, and then we have the applications that reside on that infrastructure. And somehow we need to package up those applications in a reproducible format that you can use to deploy to the infrastructure. And so when we think of the infrastructure layers, we tend to start to think about things like host security, networking, cluster security, the container runtime security as well, and how do we lock that down. Uh, in some ways, there's uh, a lot of what we do in the host security and the networking world are very, and cluster security world are very basic, and we uh, are just adapting things that we've been doing for years in the security world to the uh, uh, infrastructure layer. So on the build process, we tend to think of things as things, the problems or challenges that you're trying to solve is understanding where the software comes from that you're going to be deploying to your infrastructure. So. Uh, there's, who's heard of the term shift left or shifting left, right? It's a big buzzword uh, these days. Um, I think that we tend to think of it uh, that we're shifting responsibility to the left. I think what uh, you really want to focus on is that we're shifting choice to the left. And so we're empowering the teams at the beginning of the process uh, with a lot more uh, choices in what they can choose to actually package up and put into those containers. And then these containers start to become a black box. And so if we start to think of it as that way, that the choice is shifting left, we have to understand how do we make, uh, help them make good choices, as my wife would tell my kids, or as I would tell my kids, make good choices. Uh, and so uh, developers, much like children, I guess, uh, we need to help them make good choices. <laughs> no offense to any developers in the room. Uh, on the runtime level, uh, we want to think of things, uh, sorry, I, just so we look at these things then in this way. I was too caught up in my joke and that it landed really well uh, that I forgot to cover these. So we tend to make good choices around where our software comes from and the artifacts that we're putting in and verifying that we're getting the thing that we expect. Uh, and then also vulnerability management, not only from the upstream operating system perspective, but also application vulnerabilities. And then at the runtime level, there's a uh, the runtime level is where things really start to begin to change uh, from our, the way that we've done things traditionally. Uh, the build system is very, very similar to what we've worked with before, that we're just creating an artifact. Uh, and by the way, I think that uh, all of distributed computing's problems are just about how you ship an artifact around and how you make that secure. Um, and so when we have that artifact and we're going to have that artifact running, we need to think about how do we get secrets into that artifact uh, how do we do things like service or container admittance? And there's a lot of open source projects right now uh, that are starting to focus on that. Uh, Spiffy Inspire uh, is one, and as well as uh, this technology that's been coming out called Service Meshes. Uh, do a lot around that layer. Uh, and then anomaly detection and forensics is also something really important. So containers don't last long. Uh, they spin up, spin down very quickly. Uh, and so that container might go away uh, within a matter of minutes after it's spun up. So if it got compromised in that time, one, how do you know? And then how do you look into that container to actually know what was going on uh, in this object that no longer exists and you can't get back? Some challenges is that, as I already mentioned, decisions are pushed to the edge or pushed to the left. Uh, containers are very ephemeral. Uh, there are some benefits, though, because your attack service has been reduced if you're building a container properly. Uh, you don't necessarily have all of the traditional tools inside of that container that an attacker might need to then go and bounce someone somewhere else once they've got into the, uh, uh, got into the operating system. Uh, 
Uh, and then resource isolation. Resource isolation in the containerized world uh, has its benefits, uh, but it also has its drawbacks. Uh, if resource isolation gets broken in a containerized world, uh, then they have access to the entire host. Or if a privileged pod, uh, somebody gains access to a privileged pod, they have an access to the entire host. And so it, it's much easier to break, well, uh, I wouldn't say that it's easier to break isolation from hypervisor uh, in a hypervisor world. I would say that uh, uh, the way the resource isolation works is that if resource isolation gets broken in a containerized world, I think it, you, you have many more problems uh, than you would in a hypervisor world. So you kind of can think of infrastructure security in these uh, different layers. And I'm just going to focus on a couple tools here real quick and things that you can do. So at the cluster layer, um, you have things like RBAC, role-based access, access control, security po policies, and affinity. Uh, most of the schedulers in the uh, uh, container cloud native world and Kubernetes has this thing called affinity. So you can actually have workloads that are scheduled and you put them, uh, you can basically say, I never want this workload to be scheduled next to this workload. So if you have uh, a workload that's processing sensitive data, and you, would, uh, you can isolate that over onto its own hosts uh, to process that sensitive data, and then you don't have things like your web front end running right alongside of it, right? Uh, on the host and container runtime side, um, and by the way, most of these are all configurable in the YAML uh, or JSON that you ship up into Kubernetes. So these are all well-documented things uh, in the Kubernetes world. There's host container runtime security, uh, focus around SecComp, SE Linux, and AppArmor, tools that we've been using for a long time on the host layer. Uh, but then also an important one uh, that we need to start to focus on and make sure that your developers are putting in uh, are resource constraints. And what resource constraints can do, so you have to understand that when a container runs on a host, all the resources of that host are shared uh, with every single container. And so it's very easy for someone, if you don't put resource constraints in place, it's very easy for one bad container to then take over or overwhelm or almost DDoS the operating system of the underlying host. So resource constraints are very important to put in. Uh, I've kind of talked about uh, service mesh a little bit, uh, but there's also network policy and network filtering. Uh, I should have wrote this tool on the board, but there's a tool called Cilium uh, that does layer seven uh, network filtering, and it allows you to control what applications can talk to other applications. And then the network policy uh, is also something very powerful that K Kubernetes allow you, allows you to abstract away. Um, and then some tools that kind of help check uh, whether if you put all of these layers in place. There's one um, by a company called Aqua called KubeHunter, and KubeHunter will actually go and pen test your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, to look for common misconfigurations that allow people to have access. So uh, things like dashboards being exposed or the, uh, what's called the Kubelet API endpoint being exposed. So every single node has a little daemon that runs called the Kubelet, which allows that to talk back into the Kubernetes master, and that's how workloads get scheduled. Uh, that API, if you leave it open, uh, it can be compromised, and it has been compromised. So Kube Hunter will look for kind of those common things that you uh, might be doing wrong. Kube Bench is another tool by Aqua as well, uh, and this allows you to kind of benchmark your Kubernetes infrastructure against the CIS benchmarks. Uh, and then another tool that I think is pretty powerful but still pretty early is KubeSec. Um, what KubeSec will do is now that we've shifted power and control to the left and into the developer's hands, what you can do with KubeSec is when that YAML that they give you to deploy their application to put into Kubernetes, KubeSec will actually check that YAML to say, is this uh, following best practices? Are they running as a user? Uh, are, there, are they trying to launch a privileged pod? Are they mounting up file systems we don't want them mounting up? Uh, and other things like that as well. So KubeSec goes to the left and it allows the developers to actually sanity check and you can stop a build if their deployment doesn't have some of the things that you want uh, to have on in that deployment. So resource constraints, uh, network policy, pod security policies, and so forth. Uh, and there are security policies as well. So the security policies allow you to um, uh, fine tune what can be accessed from a, a host perspective, uh, the user group of the container, read-only file system, and you can restrict to make sure that when that deployment runs, 
uh, that these things are in place, and if they're not in place, uh, the pod security policy allows you to actually automatically have those applied and defined. Uh, the only thing the developer would need to do is specify what pod security policy they're wanting to use. So on the build security side, so I'm gonna talk about a tool called Encore here. Um, so when you think about everything that needs to happen from a security perspective to get the uh, uh, container out and running in the application, uh, there's lots of things around static code analysis and so, uh, source code dependency checks and other things like that. When we get into the build level, what we wanna start looking at are things like uh, build artifact scanning, doing the dependency checks again, configuration checks, uh, as well as other best practice checks as well. And this is really what all ends up getting packaged up and put into the container image that we're gonna ship out. So container image scanning, uh, you should think of it in this way. So tools and services at a high level should take input uh, minimally as the built container image. Uh, they need to analyze and inspect inside of that container image itself. Uh, it should also perform various types of security and best practice and compliance checks. So actually checking the configuration uh, of the application that's getting packaged up so that they're not uh, doing silly things, uh, exposing ports we don't want them to expose in their application and other things like that as well, storing secrets and environment variables, all of those sorts of things. Um, so it should result in a report or notification or a control decision based upon analysis checks. And I think the really interesting thing that you can start to do is control decisions and so that you can have this automated system that's automatically checking the images and then Kubernetes has an interesting feature called uh, admission controllers, and the admission controller can actually go and check your uh, source of data around this scan to say if this container image has been violated uh, policy and we don't want it running in our environment, the admission controller can actually deny that thing from being ran. Uh, the other cool thing that you can do with this in the world of Kubernetes is that you can have what's called a, a mut mutating uh, admission controller to where if they ask for a particular container image, you can say, no, you need to run this container image instead. So you can make them and force them get onto uh, an image automatically that's been scanned and you, uh, has been checked. Uh, so the Encore engine is container native, so it has idea of what a container is. And one of the problems is, is that when you try and take some of these tools that have existed for a while and run them in this environment, they don't have the construct or an abstraction of what a container is. So it becomes much harder to use them. Uh, you run it as a service and it has a broad API that you can interact with. Uh, and it has policy checks that you can customize for security best practices and other things as well. So there are different types of checks that you can do. So you can do OS package checks. You can also do third party checks as well for things like NPM, Jim, and Java dependencies as well. Uh, you can look at the file names and the contents of their file, of the files as well. Uh, you can also look at the build metadata itself, so the Docker file as well, and making sure that inside of the Docker file that best practices are being followed and uh, we're not pulling things from locations that we don't want them to. Uh, it'll check for software vulnerabilities not only in the operating system packages, uh, but also in third party packages. And it can also check to make sure to see if secrets are being packaged into the container image somehow uh, as well. Uh, so the way that you end up using it uh, is that you put it in your delivery pipeline. Uh, so developers would ship their code to Jenkins like they always do. Uh, and then you have a check that actually uh, goes through the Encore analyzer. It does an evaluation as well. And then it uses a database uh, to store all of the information. So it'll pull the vulnerability information for you uh, from various locations, store it in the database and do the evaluation. Uh, if the image fails, uh, then uh, you can uh, go back to the developer and have that feedback loop and tell them that their build failed. Uh, but you can also choose to, uh, which are, depending upon what your risk level is for the application, you can decide to let the application go forward. So Encore is very flexible with what you can do in the policies. And you can say, well, at least I wanna know that I'm running uh, this piece of code with this medium vulnerability in it. It's not a high or severe, so I don't feel like we need to patch it right away. We can go ahead and ship it out. Uh, so I'll skip this architecture slide because I'm going a little uh, slow, I feel. Um, so there's different ways to install Encore. Um, you can use it via a Docker Compose file. Uh, you can run it directly from the command line as well, so it's pretty easy to actually stand up and use. Uh, you can also run it as a Helm chart. So uh, 
Uh, Helm is definitely beginning, starting to become kind of the standard uh, for deploying Kubernetes applications. Uh, so you can deploy it via a Helm chart as well. I wouldn't recommend taking a picture of this and trying to run those commands. <laughs> um, so from a build perspective, uh, there is a plugin as well that you can use uh, to use Jenkins for CI and CD. Uh, and basically what you need to do is uh, uh, the image list, uh, configure uh, a few settings, whether if you want the build to fail or not, uh, and then also uh, how many retries you want and plus some user information. Uh, and this is what it will look like uh, when the evaluation comes through. Uh, you can see that there is one stop action, one warning action, uh, and zero go actions. And so it stopped because it had one of the stops actions triggered. And then it'll also give you the actually the report as well right in the, the Jenkins UI. Uh, they also um, talk about, uh, you also can do, as I said, the admission controllers as well. Uh, and there's uh, a mission controller that they actually, uh, uh, that uh, the Encore team ships. Uh, you can also use it with uh, Sysdig uh, and uh, Falco. So what you can do, and I'm gonna talk about Falco here in a minute, so this doesn't necessarily make sense to you. Uh, but you can basically, uh, what we wrote a little integration that what will happen is, is it will automatically generate Falco rules based upon images uh, that are kind of, um, uh, I don't want to use the term, um, on a list that you don't want <laughs> blacklisted, but I, we, I don't know another term besides blacklisted, but that's a term we should probably stop using. Uh, so we should, um, basically what will happen is, is then when we see one of these container images try to get ran, uh, we'll send a notification and let someone know. And so I'll cover uh, Falco here in just a second. All right, so on the runtime security side, uh, let's talk about uh, service admittance a little bit. So service admittance, uh, I'm not gonna cover it, but basically what it is is what's allowed to run a service. So what's, uh, what's allowed to be part of that service, uh, of that microservice, and does the application actually fit somebody who I want joining uh, that particular service? Uh, so secure secrets are all about how applications authenticate. authenticate. Uh, so basically, uh, how do we get secrets into the container? So using tools like HashiCorp's Vault and other things like that as well. Uh, there's anomaly detection. So how do I know if my runtime environment is being tampered with? Uh, you can also think of this as kind of traditional host intrusion detection system as well. Uh, and then forensics. What happened if something was compromised as well? So I'm going to focus on the anomaly detection side uh, here. So we, it gets interesting when we think about the changes that uh, containers have brought us. Uh, so because uh, what's in a container is much more well-scoped as to just what you need to actually run the application, you have a much smaller footprint. And because you have a much smaller footprint when you kind of have this abstraction of a container, uh, you, you know what's to, what, what you expect. So you know that the container is going to maybe write to these particular directories. You know that these processes are going to be running. And you know that with a high degree of certainty that it should only ever be listening on these ports. And if you start to violate those things, and maybe further in the build, or earlier in the build process, you detect that all of a sudden we're listening on a new port, you can stop that build and say, okay, like we're listening on a new port now, when were you gonna tell me that we needed to add this into our rules? And you can use these types of anomaly detection to say that this container should never get shipped forward. Uh, so let me introduce Falco to you. Uh, Falco is a CNCF sandbox project uh, focused on runtime security for cloud native platforms. Uh, it allows you to detect abnormal behaviors uh, in your applications, in your containers, and in your hosts. Uh, we're also adding in a lot of integrations around uh, how do we pull data from other sources as well. So one thing that we're gonna be doing uh, very, very shortly is adding in Kubernetes audit events and allow you to write rules around those Kubernetes audit events. So anytime somebody hits the Kubernetes API and performs an action, we'll get that event uh, over to us and then you can apply rules to it to decide what action you wanna take or whether if you just wanna log it. Uh, it detects suspicious activity defined by a set of rules, and I'll show you that here in a second. Uh, it uses our sister open source project, Sysdig's uh, filtering and expression language. So you kind of saw the expression language earlier on the screen, but I'll go through that here in just a second. Uh, 
Uh, what's different about Sysdig is that it uses, uh, or I'm sorry, what's different about Falco is that it also leverages Sysdig's container and orchestrator support. So we can see on the host operating system, depending upon what container runtime you're running, uh, what C groups have been created, what namespaces have been created, the abstraction around what a container actually is on the host operating system. We'll detect that and we'll be able to give you information around the container ID, the image name, and all of that information that you expect. From an orchestrator perspective, we'll also pull that information in from the orchestrator. So we'll tell you what pod it's running in, what services, namespace, all of that information uh, as well. Now, when a rule is violated, what will happen is, is that you can alert uh, to various locations, to file, standard out, syslog, or, or arbitrary programs as well. And that's another area uh, that we're gonna be improving as well, is giving you more destinations and places to go and push the information to. What a lot of companies do uh, with Falco is they just use it as another mechanism where they log a lot of information. And so there might be rules violations that are going off that are more notices or informational, and they use this to actually establish what they consider normal for their environment, and then they can use this information as well if there is an incident, and they can aggregate it with other information as well to find out what actually happened in the environment at that time. Uh, and as I said, it's open source, so anyone can contribute rules or improvements. So some quick examples for you. Uh, so the first one, somebody's spawned a shell inside of a container. So maybe they're doing troubleshooting, uh, maybe they're not doing troubleshooting. Uh, but generally speaking, running a shell inside of a container if you're not doing troubleshooting is bad. Uh, you can then go and update the container and change it from the immutable image uh, that it's based upon, and then that never gets back into the environment, uh, into the actual container build environment, and now you've made a change that nobody knows about. Um, when that container dies, of course, that change is gone, and so if you need to make that change again, then you have to run a shell again. But it's also a kind of a common point where somebody's going interactive uh, in an environment that's not supposed to be interactive. Uh, overriding system binaries, so uh, FD directory in that list, and uh, they're trying to do a write. So uh, we don't necessarily care if someone's reading from that directory, but if somebody's trying to write to the bin directory, uh, that's a problem. Uh, a container's tried to change its namespace, so it's trying to escalate its privileges uh, so that it could go and communicate with other containers in that, uh, another namespace. And then uh, we don't care if Docker or Sysdig tries to change the namespace. Uh, we only care if other things change the namespace. And then, uh, you know, trying to hide yourself, so somebody's trying to create something under slash dev uh, that's not a block device. Uh, uh, and that's essentially what that does, yes. And then it is not dev null, so you're not trying to write to dev null. And of course, the one that happens on all of your microservices environments uh, especially your cloud environments, is that somebody's trying to access the webcam. It's a joke, because hopefully you don't run. <laughs> um, so the way Falco works from an architecture perspective, there is a kernel module. Uh, that kernel module basically takes back a stream of system calls. So these are the low-level calls that users and applications use to access things uh, like disk, memory, uh, network, run commands, other things like that as well. Uh, that stream of system calls goes through some processing libraries that we borrow from the Sysdig open source project. Uh, and then we create a stream of, of events that goes through the Falco rules engine. And if there's an alert, then we go and send that alert out to the various <coughs> notification channels. We're actually making some changes here to where we're gonna be much more generic uh, at the bottom. So not only will we have a tap into the kernel, but we'll have a generic HTTP endpoint where you can then pull data from other sources as well. Uh, and then we've also made some code changes to make it much easier to add in other endpoints where you can pull data from directly as well. That'll still go through the processing libraries and the rules engine, but it gives you a lot more flexibility and a lot more that you can monitor with Falco. There's, excuse me. There's 25 uh, rules available out of the box. Uh, and they're really kind of focused on uh, con common container best practices. So is somebody writing a file in bin or Etsy directories, reading of sensitive files, binaries being executed other than your command or entry point? So here's an example of a rule. Um, so we have a couple different things that make up a rule file. Uh, the first one are macros. The macros are essentially shortcuts. Uh, so if you need to use an expression over and over and over again, then you should go 
Once you've used it in more than one rule, you should probably create a macro. And so this is basically going to define uh, what our binary directories are. So we have this list, bin, sbin, user bin, user sbin, and then basically what will happen is, is when we call the macro, which we do down here a little bit further, uh, that expression will get put in the place of, uh, of the macro. Now we also have lists as well. So this list right here of shell binaries, uh, we could have made a list here and included the list uh, for bin directories uh, uh, instead of calling out the list directly. But the list allows you to list out things and then you can use it later. So um, here uh, you can see, we actually don't use this list, but here you can see that we have a bin directory and the event direction is uh, exit. So this basically means that the system call has exited uh, and we're getting a return value back from the system call and somebody opened something for writing and it's not a pa package management process. Uh, well, you know, in theory, you probably wouldn't want this because you shouldn't run package managers and containers either, but uh, so this would actually detect this and then it would send an alert out that a file below a known binary directory was open for writing. Uh, you can use these same uh, variables that you're using, uh, these fields, in the output as well. So we'll get the actual username, we'll get the command line, and we'll get the file that was open for writing as well. So let's talk a little bit about how you can use Falco, and then I'll wrap up with a quick demo. Um, so a couple different things. Uh, one thing that we did was create what's called a response engine with some security playbooks for Falco. Uh, so we'll detect abnormal events with Falco. We'll publish the events to a pub sub service, uh, such as NATS. And then uh, you can have subscribers that subscribe to various topics. So uh, every Falco alert is, uh, has a classification, like notice, informational, critical, uh, so forth. And you can subscribe to specific topics. Uh, so if, for instance, uh, you just want to take notice events or critical events, then you just subscribe to that particular topic on the pub sub server. Uh, and then those subscribers can then take action. So for instance, this Falco star uh, could be uh, subscribed to by a service that's going back and logging everything in something like Elasticsearch for you. And then the subscribers can take actions. They can do things like kill an offending pod. Uh, you can taint uh, a worker node to prevent scheduling. So uh, you can leave that node around, uh, but it will no longer get any more workloads because maybe you're not sure about how far container isolation was broken or if it was broken at all. Uh, it can isolate a pod with networking policy as well. So this keeps the pod around as well. So then you can go back and do forensics inside of those uh, containers running the pod. Or you could do things like sending a notification via Slack. And we've published all of these uh, on our GitHub repository, which I'll have a link towards the end. So basically the way it works is that Falco will pull the data and events from the Kubernetes environment. Uh, we have a little sidecar that Falco is using to push the events into NATs. And then what we implemented was uh, kubeless functions. So kubeless is a functions as a service or serverless. Uh, framework, and we use kubeless to go and subscribe to the uh, messaging server, and then also to take action in our environment. Uh, there's a link for you uh, to a good blog post around uh, open source container runtime security. It covers Falco uh, and Encore a lot more as well. I'm going to snap a photo of that. All right, so I think this is something that we should look at more as an industry. So functions for operations. So it's really, really easy to write simple functions to react not only to security events, but also operational events as well in your environment. Uh, a great example of this is that if you're using AWS, you can have Lambda functions in your cloud formation templates, and those Lambda functions can then go and do things and query information in your environment, and you can pull that back into the cloud formation template to make it more dynamic. Uh, you can also have functions, though, that can see behaviors in your environment uh, to then go and take action. Uh, so in this case, uh, we wrote these functions to delete a pod, to notify teams, to log events uh, as well. And the nice thing is, is you can have multiple subscribers to the same event, and each subscriber can take a different action based upon how you want to slice and dice it. The other thing is, is that you get small reusable components, uh, and if you need to make a change to one piece of your automation, you're just changing one function, you're not having to change your entire automation platform that you're using. So I think this is something uh, that as security people, we should probably look at a little bit more about how you can write these functions to take action on security events. 
Uh, you can use, also use file code to kind of build a, uh, a sim. Um, this is an area that I want to work more on. I was having a good conversation with a friend last night uh, around uh, how some of the logging providers are really, really focusing in on this area and making tons of money on it. And so I feel like it's a right place for uh, people in the Falco community to contribute in Kibana dashboards and other things like that as well to build this sim. Uh, but with a combination of Elasticsearch, FluentD, and Kibana, uh, you can collect all of the security events from Falco. Uh, then you can easily do aggregation and uh, reporting of these events across uh, various other pieces of information as well. Uh, and this is uh, a horrible graphic of what it looks like. But the cool thing is, is that if you've never used Kibana, what you can then do, so you can see all of the rules uh, and each, which rules are firing. We see rules by priority as well. And so you can click on any one of these. And then down at the bottom, when you build this, you can have all of the events that actually correspond to that. So it allows you to use the graphical interface to present information, and then you can easily drill down into that interface to get more information about what the actual events are that are causing these problems. And I think there's a lot more that we could do in this in the community, and it's probably something I'm going to add on my roadmap to pr improve in the community. So uh, I'll do a quick demo here, um, if everyone's happy with me. All right, so let me show you some rules real quick. Uh, for this particular demo. Uh, so uh, how many people have ever find, found a Bitcoin miner running on their production systems? You don't need to raise your hand. <laughs> uh, but this is becoming more and more of a common kind of thing that people are doing. So uh, they don't really care about getting data out of your environment. They just want to use and steal your CPU power. Uh, and so this will actually detect that uh, somebody is running in a node uh, node app front end. So here we're using metadata from Kubernetes. And so we're, if we're in this namespace and we have this pod of this particular label, then this rule is going to apply. So you can see here that I'm using that macro. And uh, somebody spawned a process, and the container ID does not equal host. Let me scroll over. There we go. And you, then you can also see that the processes command line contains stratum TCP, right? Which is a common, um, uh, a common protocol that's used to co connect back to minor pools. So if anyone ever runs a command with that in the processes command line, then an alert would be fired. And then the other thing that we have here is that you can list out kind of common ports that miners are using, the more popular pools. Uh, and then you can basically define a macro here that says if the port is in minor ports, uh, and then if any uh, outbound connection uh, to one of those ports gets fired, then we'll throw a critical alert as well. Now what we're gonna do and what we're gonna run to actually take action, to kind of give you an example of how simple these functions can be that you can write. So I wrote a really, really simple Python script uh, that basically allows you to delete the pod. So it's going to get the priority, it's going to get some other output fields that Falco has sent over, and if the priority is critical, uh, then we're going to log a message, and then we're going to find what namespace this pod lives in, and then we're going to go and delete the particular pod. That's okay, because if it's a stateless application and it's not storing data, then we can do that, and then Kubernetes will just reschedule that pod and spin it back up. So let me make sure my environment, see if I can do this. Yeah, it hasn't been too bad. All right, so you can see I've got a uh, Falco deployed to my environment, and then I'm gonna sure. run down here, kubectl get pods for the particular namespace I care about. And I'm just gonna have that in a loop. And then while that runs, I'm gonna do a kubectl get pods and I need to see where it's actually running. All right. All right, so back to the window I want. So here, uh, I have Falco running. Falco's been, so we have a daemon set, we have a Helm chart that you can use as well to deploy Falco. Uh, if I just run a kubectl, get pods, and I need to see what host 
So you can see that there's some activity that Falco's already detected. Uh, so it'll see a lot of stuff. It'll see as Kubernetes is bringing up a pod and other information like that as well. Uh, you can see that a, a file was open for writing. Uh, namespaces are being changed and other information like that as well. Uh, so either you may want that information, you can turn it off in your log file if you don't want it uh, by just changing um, the um, log level that you care about. So in this environment, what I'm gonna do is, uh, this command never ran. All right, well, you'll have to imagine with me. So I'm gonna do a kubectl uh, exec, and I'm going to get into this particular front end. And so I got a shell on the container, and you can see right away that the message was uh, sent across that a shell was spawned on the container. And then I'm just gonna do a curl uh, stratum. And this is gonna fail because the protocol is not there. Oh, it didn't work. There's a bug in this demo environment. So I should have been killed. If I go and do other things though, if I touch a file, uh, so if I do touch something under um, bin, you can see that a file below a known binary directory uh, uh, was open for writing and so forth. So then uh, you should have action taken, so the container should have been killed. Uh, it worked this morning when I tested it. Um, but this is, this is Falco and how you can kind of use Falco. So let me just jump back to the slides. Uh, so in closing, uh, we're an open source project. Uh, Encore is also an open source project as well. Uh, we have public Slack teams uh, uh, that you can participate in as well, the Falco website, and then uh, the GitHub repositories for both of the projects uh, as well, which you can find uh, all of our code there as well as some other repos as well that kind of give you additional rules and other things like that as well. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll be around a little bit for questions.